Hi, I'm Dubber. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. Something that's a huge part of the culture of the MTF community is that of making. You hear the word maker associated with hackers, programmers, and builders of technology, but making and crafting is so deeply woven into human tradition, it's part of who we are. So as it happens, MTF's founder Michaela was talking late last week with Frederick Bass. He's a curator at the Design Museum in Den Bosch in the Netherlands, and they were chatting about the problems that you get with a lot of art that's ostensibly about technology and innovation. He'd been to see a particular exhibition, and he said something that was just really interesting and that I want to share with you with his permission. He said, I wasn't very impressed. I'd seen a lot of those pieces earlier this year in Rotterdam, and not surprisingly, since some of the same organisations are involved, but what struck me then and now, is that most projects adopt a certain sci-fi techno-aesthetic, especially if artefacts are involved. Combined with everything being very literal, the object installation is a single resultant, which makes most things on view quite one-dimensional. Although the works tend to be explorative, the speculative aspect suffers because of this. Those projects seem to be merely illustrating a point or concept, and not to reflect on societal impact and such. End quote. And you know, I really like that idea, that to talk about technology, about our artefacts and our place in the world, and to reflect on societal impact of our tools and technologies and our ability to communicate across the globe, it doesn't have to be all robots and holograms. In fact, there's something really evocative and, dare I say it, confrontational about something that comes from the other end of the spectrum. And I say confrontational because, well, we're pushing towards 50 episodes of this podcast, and this interview is probably the one that's made me the most uncomfortable since we started doing it. You might hear a little of that in my voice along the way. So Deirdre Nelson is an Irish artist designer based in Glasgow. She studied textiles at Glasgow School of Art in 1992 and an MPhil in 1996, She's exhibited internationally and undertaken residencies both in the UK and Australia, and most recently has been engaged in a project called the Circumpolar Crafters Network. Now, if you're a little squeamish, a fair warning, there's a fairly robust description of the use of what you might call traditional materials, like the insides of seals and bits of reindeer. But it's a fascinating story and an incredibly rich way of exploring ideas about how what we make connects with who we are, what impact we have on our world, and what society can become. But also we talk about electronic music generated from knitting patterns, addressing waste in consumerist societies, veganism, and how we can bridge that divide between traditional crafts and hacker coder culture. From our recent visit to Expo North in Scotland, here's my chat with Deirdre Nelson. Enjoy. Deirdre, tell me, what is the Circumpolar Crafters Network? The Circumpolar Crafters Network was something that was put together by the Nunavut government. They decided that they wanted to do a project which would promote sealing or in the use of um, seal products for craft. So they brought together crafters from Estonia, Norway, Sweden, Finland um, and Nunavut in Canada. So, And we managed to sneak in an Irish woman and a Scottish woman. <laughs> but generally the idea is yes. north. Yes, the idea is looking north and seeing what we, I suppose, we share in terms of craft craft skills and uh, use of indigenous materials. Right. So why is it important to continue to use seal as a, as a material? Well, it's a huge part of um, tradition, first of all, and culture in Inuit communities. And also it's a very sustainable way of working. People make garments that last them a lifetime, that keep them warm in really extreme temperatures. And no sort of um, manufactured material can match that in terms of warmth. Mm-hmm. People make um, boots and jackets that last them for all their lives. When the seal is hunted, um, it's hunted very quickly and humanely. And it also, um, every little bit of the um, the animals used, so everything from the sinews inside to, um, not wanting to get too gory, but so in terms of, um, there's nothing thrown away, really. Right, because when you hear seal hunting, that's not what you picture. No, and I think there's been a lot of media coverage um, through the years of um, seal hunting and seal um, culling and all sorts. But I think um, the, in terms of the Inuit community, it's a particular type of seal that they, um, and it's part of a, I suppose, part of an ecosystem where they're 
um, you know, the the um, there there's huge numbers of these animals, and people are keeping obviously keeping the animal numbers under control in the the ecosystem at a sort of level. Um, and I think so many of the campaigns have been maybe slightly misguided. They're talking about different types of seal, maybe more endangered animals. Um, they're not representing the culture or tradition of people at all. Right. And so the, the whole idea is it's around culture and, tra- uh, culture and tradition, um, but very much about making things. And it's not just about making things in the traditional way either. It seems like from, from what I've seen that there are people doing some quite innovative things. Yes, there's a lot of... Uh, well, particularly in the Circumpolar, we got together and, um, with the network and we worked with materials from all the different places. So, you know, you had Inuit women making Inuit boots, but using reindeer hide or Scottish wool. Or So people were starting to experiment in different ways. But there's a lot of the younger Inuit makers are making bags, contem- very contemporary garments that um, one girl had made seal skin trousers that you would see on a catwalk show, a young designer. So there's a lot of innovative things are happening and people using it in different ways. So it's not um, only about the traditional jackets or, or boots that the Inuit wear. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people, when when you hear maker, you think of, or particularly in the music tech fest community, you think of people using uh, electronics or you think of people sort of repurposing things to make new inventions. But the, the maker movement as it is really has been going on for, for centuries, I guess, the sort of the crafter uh, element of it. What sort of place does that have in culture? I suppose that uh, people have always made in terms of necessity, you know, in um, all over the world, really. I mean, I suppose I know a lot about Irish or Scottish craft, but people have always made to, and particularly textiles, which is, you know, most of the circumpolar crafters networks area, is um, people have, textiles have always been made to to sleep on, to sit on, to, you know, cover your animals, to, um, to live in. And so a huge part of culture to make things out of necessity, and I suppose as time has gone on, people are making them more as, you know, it's a luxury luxury item to be able to buy, you know, a, a beautiful seal skill handbag or, or, but, you know, people have, and still do in many communities, still do make for um, functionality, I suppose, for everyday life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talk about making, well, in terms of the cultures that I met through the Circumpolar Crafters Network, you know, a lot of making of textiles, so sewing and um weaving in terms of some of the things that have gone on in Scotland and um, and then the a lot of the craft, particularly in Sami culture, the, the men make a lot of things from wood and reindeer horn and but it's very much about using materials that are around them and materials that are very particular to their landscape and place. Mm-hmm. I, I guess that, that making things as part of culture is not unique to the north. What is it that connects these northern places that that makes them sort of stand apart from where other things are made in the world? I think um, maybe it's the access to materials are different. um, I suppose there's limited resources in lots of ways, particularly when you go much farther north. So people are you know, they work with what they've got or what they have access to. Harsh so I suppose, environments. Uh, yeah, harsh yeah. environments. And and I suppose, you know, that when I think of uh, some of the Scottish traditions of making where there maybe wouldn't be even wood on some of the islands because there's no trees. And, you know, and I'm sure it's the same in Arctic communities where you're very, uh, it's a very particular way of making that is about being extremely resourceful and um, not throwing anything away so you're using what you have access to in in quite harsh environments I think. Mm -hmm. There seems to be uh, in my mind there's a rhythmic element to uh, particularly stitching or or these these sort of repetitive craft works. Is there a musical connection there or is that just something I'm projecting? Well um, I mean I'm quite interested well very interested in music myself and I think there's there's definitely a rhythm to certain things like um, well, I do a lot of knitting, and I think with knitting, I've always wanted to work with a composer to do something based on the sound of knitting, and and also even the um, the sound of sewing. It seems like something that's very um, a quiet activity, but particularly watching some of the Inuit women working, they work with um, well now they don't work with the sinew of the seal, but they work with a sort of waxed sinew thread. And it's actually quite a, a tough process because you're going through fur or leather. So there's a sort of like rasping sound as they pull up thread. And, mm-hmm. you know, so there's a lot of, um, yeah, it's repetition and rhythm. And I suppose depending on the type of stitch they're doing or the type of material that they're working through, mm-hmm. um, 
could make particular sounds. But also the thing that happened on the Circumpolar Crafters Network was realise the tradition of singing in the cultures of... Um, so some of the women were throat singing while they were singing, and, wow. or while they were singing while they were sewing. And the Sami uh, women were yoiking yeah. uh, for us, and, and that was fantastic. Sadly, I didn't have anything to contribute myself in terms of um, music or Surely song. you come from a singing background. Well, I could sing, but not very well. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure I could sing along. But um, that, you know, very much about the sort of, uh, particularly in your throat singing, about the fun of and community of people being together and and, and the yoiking, which is very much about gifting someone a song. And I suppose in the same way as you'd gift them something that was handmade. So I suppose there's many crossovers. Right. What's your story? What's your background? How did you start... In all this, were you learning as a child, or yeah, I've I can't remember not knowing how to sew or knit. I think I must have um, done it when I was very small. Um, and my grandmother and my auntie were very good, and my my mum at that time made clothes, and so I think I where was this uh, in Ireland? Yeah, in, where, where I grew up in Northern Ireland. Okay, in, um, yeah, in a place called Bambridge. Lived for quite a while. Um, and uh, so the you know it was part of life really to do these things and you know I remember Santa Claus bringing me um, fabric and threads once right. <laughs> so I was delighted and um, but yeah I've always sort of been interested in making so um, and then carried that on and then went to art school and went to Glasgow School of Art and studied textiles and then work, I've worked a lot with different communities I do a lot of artist residencies and um, work what sparked in different that places. interest. Uh, to, to actually sort of not just kind of make things and sell them as, as many people who go to art school to do textiles will uh, eventually do. They'll be they sort of become makers and crafters and then they sell their work and that's kind of the end of the story. But you seem to have branched out and to go, well, how can this connect up to tradition and culture and, you know, different parts of the world? W- what sparked that? I think... Um well, when I first led art school, I started doing, you know, often it's quite hard to survive as an artist, and I started doing a lot of um, work in schools and with um, health centres, and, and through that, I suppose, I've learned a lot about so many different types of people, and then had the opportunity to, worked in education for a little while, and then had the opportunity to work with um, an artist residencies. There was a lot of, a lot more artist residencies were starting to emerge, and I realised that I could match that interest in people with um, skills and um, or the skills I had or could develop and then also I love traveling so any opportunity to go anywhere that um, I could learn about new cultures and I'm very interested in social history so um, so the history of places and trade particularly textile history and textiles have traveled all over the world in trade and sometimes terrible histories you know uh, textiles being you know traded for slaves and the slaves moved on to, you know, there's been a lot that's happened through, they're quite a powerful thing, Mm. textiles in terms of what they've done in the world or the economics of textiles as well. Yeah, absolutely, because, I mean, uh, I was going to say it's the fabric of so many things, but literally it's the fabric of so many things. And and that the the world is kind of made out of these things and and these objects that we, you know, we use every day and we, uh, you know, wear every day and and, and those sorts of things. So it's not just about... Um, I guess a lot of people think about things that we make are things that we use, but they're, they're so deeply embedded into our lives that they almost become invisible and part yes. of who we are. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess there's this kind of, um, the question is, does it shape who we are? Uh, do do the, the textiles that we use or the, you know, for instance, the seal slippers that you were speaking about, does that kind of shape who we become or how we work or how we live? I think so. I think it can do. And, and also the, you know, I suppose one of the things I've learnt through being part of the Circumpolar Crafters Network is that we can also, by wearing or using these things, we can also um, shape the lives of other people around us, and but not in a sort of campaigning, aggressive way, but in a way of gentle sort of discussion about you know the issues around materials. I think we take a lot of materials that we wear for granted. We you know we don't know where our clothes are made. We um, I mean I think people are starting to change. They're beginning to think differently. But you know the throwaway culture of textiles that are you know just that are hardly worn and then thrown away or that end up in you know someone in Africa wearing clothes that we've thrown out and you know and um, or end up in landfill and you know and I think textiles are really much more important to think than people give them credit for you know in terms of um, I think there's a lot that can be done through textile production and, and rethinking 
um, is, our own behaviours, I think. Yeah, yeah. Is in that in that context with, with um, like a lot of innovation has led to a lot of waste. Yeah. Is the kind of um, move towards innovation uh, compatible with a, a desire to sort of preserve uh, traditions and uh, and this kind of you know, circular approach to uh, to economies? I mean, I think people are. Um, I think it's changing, and people are beginning to. There's people working in sort of innovative ways with um, circular economy, but I suppose there's a lot more that could be, could be done. And um, and I think that the yeah, it's nearly. I, I sometimes think it's nearly about a, a re-education of people. In some ways, we nearly need you know psychologists to come in and get us to rethink our consumption. And it's a much bigger thing than just you know. Um, the cloth we put in our back, we need to really educate ourselves. And I think um, there are companies doing amazing things with, you know, using less water or using, I suppose, technologies to help um, produce much more ethical or, um, and social media and, you know, the internet has really helped in terms of educating people and people that set up groups that are all about uh, about that and about repair. And I mean, I'm involved in a repair lab um, or repair cafe in Glasgow and that's an amazing way to talk to people about how they use their, t- or how they repair their textiles or... Um, mm. So I suppose there's yeah the interesting things going along and technology supports that in a lot of ways. There's a lot of talk about wearable technologies too now. What could people who build wearable technologies learn from traditional crafters? Oh, um, I think I mean sometimes some of the things that I, I uh, find in terms of wearable technology is sometimes the crafted element or the um, you know the say embedded textiles and clothes or things sometimes the there's a little bit of the craft element missing they still come across as something very digital and very um i think there's there could be a lot of very interesting collaborations where you work with really you know very very skilled craftspeople that imagine if you could make a seal jacket that had embedded technology that would help a hunter in Nunavut or a you know a family and you know and living in the arctic or um so I think there's probably ways that more could be done where people work together, but you know, very established, you know, skilled craftspeople. Mm. Um, as, as far as the innovation side of things going, and one of the things that we were talking about earlier before we started this interview, uh, you were talking about uh, your embroidery and uh, the idea of uh, connecting embo- embroidery with music. Do you want to tell me a little bit about how you, how you go about that? Yeah, well, I've I've had an idea for a while, maybe to. Um, you know, it would be fantastic if you could create a sort of objects or, or clothing that was very be embedded very much in tradition of a culture or um, um, or skill and then work alongside maybe technology in some way. So either that could be linked with sound or music or something that gives, a, I suppose, in a way, a bigger picture of the story. Because, you know, I was talking about textiles, sometimes they're taken for granted and you look at something and think it's decorative, but what if that decorative piece of embroidery then could tell a story through um through music uh, through linking maybe with a you know a, a traditional musician or it could be storytelling or something that enriches i think it could really enrich that experience mm-hmm. and i don't know enough about the technologies but you know maybe i don't know could you do something that was heat censored or that could change or you know i suppose that's sometimes they, they're very separate the very traditional you know, um, sort of indigenous skills are v- seem very separate to the technological side of things. So it'd be really nice if there's some way you could marry, marry both. Yeah, and it does seem to me that things like embroidery patterns and knitting patterns and those sorts of things are, seem to be programming manuals. Yes, very much. There's, there's this real kind of uh, similar way of thinking yeah. built into that. Is that? Um, I mean, I guess uh, it's very much a, a kind of a, a traditionally a women's um, craft, yeah. um, as is programming. Yeah. Um, and those those things sort of have this kind of uh, connecting thread. Do you think it's still possible to kind of connect those worlds uh, in much the same way, sort of traditional crafters and, and contemporary sort of electronics makers and, and those sorts of things? Yeah, I think so. I think because um, there's so much about... I mean, I know a few people who are doing some interesting things... Um, mm. There's one guy, David Littler, who's working with um, punch cards from um, knitting patterns and sewing patterns, and he's actually working through making music machines that you can put these punch cards through. So he and he's very interested in songs that are connected. There's a lot of very old traditional songs and music connected with textiles, particularly in Scotland. But a lot of the mills all over the UK would have had um, very 
traditional songs that were sung, mill workers would have sung, or or um, women working with tweed would have. So he's doing some interesting things with the the punch cards and um, and there's I suppose there's a there's a sort of um, coding to you know people who don't knit would read look at a knitting pattern and its code. Mm. And a lot of the really good knitters, particularly older knitters, don't think they're doing anything special, but they're reading code. They're, and it's um, it's amazing how, you know, how something can be produced from something as, you know, and I'm sure it's the same. I haven't done much weaving, but um, weaving is code as well and a lot of mathematics involved and um, patterns and... So, um, and I'm doing a little bit of work with um, musician Inga Thompson, where she's, we've taken her grandmother's old um, uh, pattern books from Fair Isle in Scotland, and she uh, plays the accordion, but uh, Inga plays the accordion and also does um, d- uh, sort of electronic music and looping and things. So she's composing music based on some of the knitting patterns and the punch cards, so, which is very much the tradition of Fair Isle, where she's from. Um, so that's an example of, and there's yeah, there's a few people looking at um, at looking at those areas, textiles, and would that make sense it? in the context of the Second Polar Crafters Network? I mean, would that sort of uh, approach to craft be welcomed in that kind of circle? I think so, because I think it could be a way of really. We spoke a little bit in our talk about um, you know how you educate people and how you, and I think to create. Um, contemporary work that brings in different audiences so if you maybe um you know had some uh, technology say embedded in something that one of the crafters had made that then i don't know i'm just thinking off the top of my head but linked with screens or linked with music or culture or historical information it could be an amazing way to get across quite a you know I suppose it's quite a contentious topic. People, you know, and I suppose as the world seems around me, so many more people are becoming vegan and becoming less sort of animal focused. So I think there's probably, there needs to be, think, or you need to think of ways that you can make something which is contemporary and relevant with some of the crafters' work. So mm. I think that would really. It would be a fantastic way of doing it. Because it does seem very much, uh, particularly from our community's perspective, there's a lot of people who do programming, a lot of people who do uh, building things with electronics and microboards and these sorts of things, and a lot of them do woodwork and a lot of them do uh, knitting and, yeah. and uh, embroidery and so on. But those do seem very much still very separate worlds, and it seems like a fantastic opportunity to bring these people who are essentially doing an extension of the same thing, uh, bringing them together in this traditional world and, and, and bridging the old and the new. And uh, do you, what do you think is the kind of the, the right way to go about that? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe we need a um, circumpolar lab or something. And, you know, and I was involved in a lab in Glasgow and um, I've forgotten the name of it now, but um, they brought together coders and makers together mm-hmm. and we, we did separate projects and um and it was an amazing way to work because we realized in loads of ways we we work in very similar way i mean i think there's a real craft to you know working with um you know uh coding and working with um arduino and all of these things and through being involved in the repair lab in glasgow i realized that you know i watched some of these guys fix computers and um and electronic you know they they're working with their hands in a really skilled way and in a you know particularly something like embroidery is very fine tuned skills and i can see those same skills in the guys working on circuit boards or um so i think maybe some maybe we need to do a circumpolar tech traditional skill lab or something it would be fantastic yeah. um it sounds like something music tech should take on yeah, yeah. definitely it would be amazing because yeah. and and also just i think with any of these things you need time to experiment uh, so you know just and the informality of say the way we worked in the circumpolar crafters network would be a really lovely way to work with technology as well um we worked in the um, lab in Glasgow with a guy called Jan Sesnick. He does a lot of beautiful work with technology and music. And he um, repro- we reprogrammed a sewing machine to sew by itself to uh-huh. music. So when people sang, the sewing machine worked. And it was he it was looking at data from a, um, a singer in Glasgow that had done a, a piece of work. And um, so whenever any of her music was played or people made bird signs, it was to do with birds, she um, the sewing machine started and began to sew the costumes for the for the performance. So and that just came through a experimental lab type setup, so um which was fantastic. Wow. 
What's the satisfaction for you? Is it the made object? Is it the recipient of the made object? Is it in the giving or is it in the selling or is it in the, the actual activity itself? I think it's a combination of everything. Um, not so much the selling. I mean, I, I suppose the way I work is much more in art projects rather than whereas a lot of the other uh, networkers, they work very much to market. You know, they're making products. And mm. so for me, it's it's the making, but also it's the... Well, if I'm work, or working collaboratively with something, it's that sort of exchange that happens. It's really interesting. And, and I prefer, I suppose, more and more with... Some of the projects I've done, I quite like to gift the work at the end, and so that it's it's got another life beyond the. Um, so, but then I suppose I've mainly worked in residencies, which have been very different than producing to to market. But I think it's a combination of everything, really, and just seeing what can happen with materials. And I don't think I could make the same thing over and over and over. It, you know, it's it's about a sort of process and how how things change. Sure. What's a good way to start? If somebody's thinking, this this is kind of interesting territory, where do I begin? What would you suggest? I would, um, trying to think, maybe join a local craft group or um, or get a group of friends to get. Sometimes that's a nice way just to do something, get a group of people together that are interested in making. And also I think um, social media and technology has a brilliant part to play because I now I can... You know, through Instagram, I can find people that are doing the most amazing things and contact them and, you know, say, oh, you know, do you fancy working on this together? Or, But also, um, I think YouTube has been a total saviour for a lot of craftspeople because people that are just learning can look on YouTube and on YouTube there'll be a demonstration for everything from, you know, probably technological things to, um, you know, to doing a particular embroidery stitch or learning to knit or making something. Um, so I think that's maybe a find a, your community. I suppose it's find your community or your network in a way around you. Because um, when we think about uh, knitting and sewing and, and uh, needlework and so on, we kind of think of it as a very solitary activity. But the way you talk about it, it sounds incredibly social. Yeah, well, I mean, I do a lot of making on my own and sometimes I like that, but I think it's a very social thing and I think it's become, I've noticed more and more over probably the last 10 years, and again, a lot of it's to do with social media, is that so many younger crafters are starting, people that maybe didn't go to art school or didn't study there, but they're, and I don't know what it is about, sometimes I think, oh, is it because there's so much technology around and so much screen-based things that people are feeling the need to get back to using their hands again and um but i've yeah i've noticed that there's so much so many more people getting involved now so and now you have a network yes and now we've got a, a new exciting uh, circumpolar network yeah fantastic deirdre thanks so much for your time that's irish textiles artist deirdre nelson and that's the mtf podcast and in case you're wondering yes of course we're thinking a lot about what she said about a circumpolar lab for joining the dots between high tech and traditional skills what a fantastic idea so if you want to be part of making that happen or to get involved in some of our upcoming events about which more very soon then you can register on the mtf website musictechfest.net slash register and in the meantime, if you haven't already subscribed, we've tried to make that really easy for you. Just click the subscribe button and don't forget to share, like, rate and review. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Cheers. 